Hi everybody, welcome back to 10 Minute Church. This is our next 10 Minute History. Um, before we start, if you watched the video on the appearance of the Messiah in Joshua last week, um, I just wanted to clarify something. Um, I did say that God, that he appeared as God in the flesh, and uh, I got a lot of um, controversy in one thread that I posed to for that because of the fact that Jesus technically was the only time that God really came in the flesh as human. Um, but let me just to say that um, in the flesh nowadays has become a metaphor for the raw physical presence of something. Um, and since I'm a writer of many varieties, sometimes I mix metaphors and into things. And I wanted to clarify that what I meant by that was that the Messiah appeared to Joshua as the raw physical presence of God in a form that he could recognize, which in this case was a human-like form. Um, so that's that's what I meant by that. So for any of you that were put off by that video, just um, know that's that's what I was trying to say, not that he was actually he actually physically human and God in the flesh. Um, la last time we did our 10-minute history, we talked about Clement of Rome, who knew many of the apostles personally, unlike several of the previous church fathers who were only involved directly with John the Elder. Our next church father is Papias of Hierapolis, uh, who, and he is usually grouped with the latter disciples of John the Elder. His involvement with John is possible and, and likely, as a matter of fact, as he even admits that he knows John and knows him very well. Uh, there is a tradition that developed claiming that Papias was actually the scribe of John, meaning that he was the one responsible for recording onto paper whatever John dictated to him. However, the evidence that he was directly involved with John the Elder is more limited than is the case with Ignatius of Antioch and Polycarp of Smyrna. That is due partially to the fact that only fragments of Papias' writings have survived. Papias is the first to explicitly mention that there are two different Johns who existed as, the disciple, as disciples of the Lord. Uh, and when he speaks of John the Elder, he comments that he sought out what John the Elder says rather than what he, he said, suggesting that John the Elder was still living and giving eyewitness instruction about the Lord at the time of Papias' writings. While it is not clear if he had contact with John the Elder directly, Papias is said by Irenaeus to have been a companion of Polycarp, meaning that he would have still had access to the Elder's teachings about Christ. However, what is important is that Papias did not limit himself to John's teachings alone. He expressly states that he was interested in gathering from all sources that had, con had had contact with every one of the apostles so that he could get an accurate picture of Jesus for his congregation. This suggests that the early church did not discriminate between one or another teaching about Jesus, so long as each teaching aligned with what the apostles had originally taught. And they went out of their way to authenticate each witness to the best of their ability before following the message of that witness with their hearts. Little is known about the life, uh, about the birth, life, and death of Papias aside from the fragments of his writing. But in addition to the information he provides on John the Elder, he also spoke of an Aramaic edition of the Gospel of Matthew that existed before the Greek manuscripts and was the one to put forth that Peter was the one behind the message of the Gospel of Mark, and that Mark was the one who was, who was the scribe of Peter and was writing down what Peter dictated. The information is help, th this information is helpful because it indicates that Matthew was originally designed to target a primarily Jewish audience instead of Gentile, and it brings authenticity to the words of Mark and makes his Gospel a very reliable eyewitness to the events surrounding Christ. Nevertheless, this, that is not all Papias is notable for. His instructions in the fragments that we do have suggest that he was an honest and reputable man, wanting only the best for the people under his care, and that he had a heart for the truth and for right living. He did, however, have a strange obsession with the concept of multiplying members of the kingdom and how that would affect the outcome of the church in the end times. His hopes that the church would multiply were not strange, uh, uh, not those, to the contrary, the whole purpose of the church, according to, Matt, uh, according to Matthew, is to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That is the Great Commission. 
And the way the early church proceeded after Jesus' ascension was to do just that. On that point, Papias was completely in line with the rest of the early church. But then Papias goes on to um, Papias goes on to describe how the final realization of the new kingdom after Christ's return will take place. And most of what he says is in accords with what we know from Scripture, particularly Revelation and John, that the house of the Lord will have many mansions, and that the kingdom will be divided amongst the people. Papias specifically divides the planes of existence in the kingdom into three realms, heaven, paradise, and the holy city, or New Jerusalem. And then he says that those who produce a hundredfold will receive heaven, those who produce sixtyfold will receive paradise, and those who produce thirtyfold will receive the city. His point is that all believers will receive the kingdom in accords with the level of their worthiness, which is measured by how they live their lives for the Lord while in their earthly existence. And to that extent, Papias is right. There is evidence in the scriptures that faith in Christ saves, but actions on behalf of Christ, kingdom advancement living, will determine what, um, or how much one gains in the final realization of the new kingdom. His hundredfold, sixtyfold, and thirtyfold deliberations even come from a parable spoken by Jesus. Where Papias strays is when he pairs those delineations up with the specific locations within the new kingdom. The three planes come from Scripture and are even joined in Revelation, but how they are joined and divided is not described in detail. The primary location that receives the greatest detail is the holy city, or New Jerusalem. And in John's vision, that city seems to be set aside primarily for the remnant of believers from amongst the Jews that Yahweh promised he would raise up throughout, throughout the writings of the prophets. In other words, the holy city of the new kingdom is the city for those who are from his original people who stayed true and believed in his son, even against their own who did not. Not only does Papias' portrayal not follow this, it also minimizes the importance of New Jerusalem in the New Kingdom realization. New Jerusalem will be the crown jewel of the New Kingdom where, where from Christ reigns the, sorry, New Jerusalem will be the crown jewel of the New Kingdom where from Christ reigns over the entirety of the created order in its redeemed and perfect state. The problem is primarily raised because we do not have the full picture from Papias' writings since they are fragmented. Without the bigger context, we cannot know what led to his writing of what he said or where he was going with his ideas in the long run. As far as we know, he was never martyred like the rest of the early church fathers during his time, so it is possible he was not seen as much of a threat to the empire. But it could also mean that he was well protected by his congregation and or was able to flee attempts at his life. We do not know. Um, however, that does not affect that the, his message, and that or what does affect is that we just do not have enough of his writings to get a clear picture. But what is clear is that he was respected by the churches in and surrounding Herapolis, and likely by others as well. And he left his contribution on the life of the church, just as all the other leaders. Thank you for tuning in. This has been Ten Minute History, um, and with uh, as part of Ten Minute Church. Um, I'm about to take two weeks off just to let you guys know, but I will be con uh, contributing some more um, some more uh, blog posts. So uh, if you just stay tuned for that, those will be posted during the two weeks. And um, tomorrow I've got a bonus episode of 20-minute pods uh, that uh, involving God and time. So we're going to have a lot of fun with that one. I actually uh, am citing a very popular philosopher from his time, that is, from the um, 5th century, uh, whose name is Boethius. So uh, if you all want to tune in, that's going to be a really good discussion, and um, I look forward to having you all. Uh, and also, don't forget Biblical News Source on Saturday. So uh, thank you all for tuning in. I hope you guys have a blessed week, and, um, and I hope God brings you great joy and um, prosperity in the, in the days ahead. And uh, and heals this country and this land. So uh, thank you all, and you uh, have a blessed week. Amen.